Welcome to Dungeness Community Church. We're glad you're joining us today. We'll be celebrating communion together this morning. If you're at home, now's a good time to hit pause and gather your elements. If you're in the auditorium and don't have your elements yet, raise your hand and an usher would be more than happy to bring them to you. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and there will be three services to choose from. The sunrise service will start at 6.15 a.m. at Port Williams with worship music and a devotional time. We will also have our two regular service times at 9 o'clock and 10.45 a.m. Let's go to Pastor Tim now with an update on COVID Phase 3. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I hope that you saw the email blast that went out a few days ago with a little video from me. Uh, and what I was updating everyone on are the most current rules for churches and faith-based organizations for gatherings. And uh, here's all four pages of it. But the good news is that they're now saying that we can sing as a congregation. Uh, the only thing they're asking is that we continue to wear masks. Uh, they say a three-layer mask. Well, it turns out that these little disposable masks count as a three-layer mask. Or if you have one of those nice cloth masks, uh, that counts as a three-layer mask as well. So uh, we will be singing together today. Also, we can sit closer together. Uh, we ask that you leave two seats between groups, but groups can be larger. Now 15 people can sit together as a group if they so desire. So if there are people you want to sit with, make sure that they're ready to have folks sitting next to them. But if they are, groups of up to 15 can sit together and then just leave a couple seats before the next group. Uh, so we are excited to see these changes just in time for Easter and especially that we can sing. So this morning, at our in-person service, uh, sing. Sing to the Lord. Thanks, Tim. It's almost time again for our free monthly movie. We will be meeting on Monday, April 5th at 7 o'clock p.m. in the chapel, and we'll be showing the movie Soul Surfer. It is a story of a teenager named Bethany Hamilton who loses her arm surfing due to a shark attack. Through it all, she discovers a greater purpose to make a difference in the lives of others. Recently, we added another option for hearing assistance. We now have Bluetooth and T-coil or Telecoil available. If you would like to take advantage of this, please contact us during the week or feel free to stop by the sound booth before or after a service. Now here's Shane, our communications director. Thank you, Colleen. You know, as we meet in person, the demands for video and audio on Sunday mornings are increasing, as are the needs to facilitate groups and gatherings throughout the week. We've had a number of amazing volunteers who helped get us through 2020, but they can only do so much. If you have a servant's heart and interest in helping out in the audiovisual booth, please reach out to me. No experience is required. We will be glad to train you and find a spot that works well for you and your schedule. Call the office or email me at shane at dcchurch.org. I'm also glad to speak with you in person after service if I can. Thank you for all you are doing to contribute to the community here at DCC and beyond. I'm looking forward to a blessed 2021. And now a word for the kids from Pastor Britt. Hey DCC kids, Pastor Britt here with a quick check-in about today's Go Plus lesson. The big idea for this lesson is Jesus saves us from sin so we can boldly tell others that I'm with him. Just hours before Jesus was arrested, Peter had sworn to Jesus that he would never betray him, not if his life depended on it. But then Jesus was arrested, and Peter began to fear that his life did, in fact, depend on him. Would they arrest him too? So, when Peter was asked if he knew Jesus, Peter said no. Three times he said no. And when he realized what he had done, he was heartbroken. He'd been afraid, even ashamed, to say that he was with Jesus. Spoiler, Peter later did share his sorrow about this with Jesus, and Jesus forgave him. The memory verse for this week's lesson is Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the good news. It is God's power to save everyone who believes. I hope you enjoy the lesson. Talk to you next week when we celebrate the good, best news of Easter because of the resurrection. Bye. Join Pastor Tim every Thursday morning for Almost Live, which is available starting at 6 o'clock a.m. Each week, he'll be sharing updates, announcements, and happenings at DCC. Then tune in again on Thursday evening for the next episode of Deep Dive. This week features Pastor Tim, 
talking to some of the folks involved in our care ministries. Now, let's join the worship team to praise our Heavenly Father. Have you been feeling buried lately? I know I have. This morning, it's time to come forth. Jesus is calling your name. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my doom Till I met you You called my name And I God's so faithful to keep calling our name when we are lost, when we're in the dark. He is our light. He's our living hope. He keeps pursuing us. He's faithful and good. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written. 
Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of This one might be a little new for you, but I think you're going to love it. It's grabbed hold of my heart over these last few weeks. Our God is faithful and true, and I just want to sing of it all the time. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up. Until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. Of the goodness of God. I love your voice. Oh, you have led me through the fire and darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. 
I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your grace and mercy, your goodness, your loving kindness that follow us all the days of our lives. We're grateful for your promise that we get to live with you forever. We're grateful that you saved us from our sin sickness. You were the cure for our death and our disease of destruction. We are grateful and we are blessed and we want to bless your holy name this morning. We lift it all up to you. Praise be the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Today we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Table. And if you haven't yet collected your elements, why don't you pause the video for just a moment so you can go and do that. The Lord's Table is a symbol of both remembrance and identity. In the symbol of the bread, Jesus gave us a reminder that his body was broken for us. In the symbol of the wine, Jesus reminds us that his blood was shed for us. But the symbols we were given are symbols that we eat and drink. They literally go into us and become part of us. They're food for our body. And in the same way, Jesus did not call us to simply remember him as a historical fact. He calls us in faith to take him in, to embrace his life as our life, to let his spirit be the animating force of our lives. Now, today is Palm Sunday. It's the remembrance of a historical event, the event of Jesus making his final entrance into Jerusalem. 
It was an entrance that was hailed by those who loved him as they gathered around and cheered and even threw their coats and palm branches before him as he rode in. But it was an entrance also that was hated by those who were jealous of him. And it was an entrance that, despite the cheering throngs, Jesus knew full well would lead in just a matter of days from a place of fame to a place of humiliation and indescribable suffering. His body would be broken. His blood would be shed. But that end would not be the end. Because as we'll celebrate next Sunday, Easter was just around the corner. The resurrection. His body was broken. His blood was shed. But from that sacrifice came a power of life that death could not conquer. As followers of Jesus, we remember his death through these simple symbols. The bread. The cup. We take them in humble thanks that his life now flows through us. I would invite you to pause the video for just a few moments and spend some time in prayer. And then, when you're ready, take the bread. And then, take the cup. And in a few moments, I will close our time in prayer. Go ahead and spend some time talking to your Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you that on this Palm Sunday, we celebrate the fact that your life was given for us. We look forward to Easter, the, the promise, the reminder that you have overcome death, that you have given us a new identity, a new life in you. Thank you for what this bread, this cup remind us of that not only is it a fact for us to look back on, but that you are a living reality in our lives today. You are the one who sustains us and feeds our souls. We give you our thanks and our praise. And we pray it all in your powerful name. Amen. Today we're going to start a new series but it's really a continuation. We just finished looking at the first 13 verses of Matthew chapter 5. It's that section that is commonly called the Beatitudes. It formed the attention-grabbing introduction to the longest sermon that we have recorded from Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I titled that series Backward Blessings because many of the conditions Jesus said would lead to blessing sound strange, even backwards to our ears. I suggested in the first message of that series that Jesus was in essence giving his disciples up on the mountain a little freshman orientation. They had been invited into a course of study under his direction that would forever alter the course of their lives. It was a change of direction they and their ancestors had longed for, to fully enter into God's kingdom. Right at the outset, Jesus begins to outline for them what being prepared for his kingdom should look like, what they should value, what they should pursue. And what they quickly discovered was that life in his kingdom looked a bit different than they expected. As I was working my way through that sermon introduction, I kept thinking, we can't stop here. No preacher wants you to stop listening just after the introduction. So we're going to press on and delve into this foundational teaching of Jesus. I was trying to think of what to title this series and finally settled on Live Like Mountain Folk. Part of the inspiration was obviously that the people listening to Jesus uh, we're told right at the outset, had followed him up onto a mountain. 
It was there that he taught them, which is why this is called the Sermon on the Mount, which I bet you had already figured out. We're going to attempt to join them there on that mountainside to see what we can learn. But the title holds a little more meaning in my mind. As a kid, I went through a phase where I read everything I could find in school and the library about Daniel Boone. I had these fantasies of being a rugged frontiersman like Daniel, a, a mountain man. One of the bits of historical trivia that has often intrigued me is how those old-time mountain men kept appointments. I mean, they largely lived solitary lives of hunting, trapping, fishing, exploring, but they would also agree to meet up, to trade goods and swap stories. And the big gatherings were called rendezvous, and they were often hosted by the fur companies. They were huge affairs with merchants traveling as far as from Europe to meet up and do business with the mountain men. Can you imagine what it was like to watch these scraggly guys emerging out of the backcountry, mules loaded with their trade goods? Some of them were seeing large groups of people for the first time in maybe a year or more. It was kind of like my first post-pandemic lockdown trip to Home Depot. But there were also smaller get-togethers where two guys would agree to a future meetup at maybe a fork in the river or some other landmark. And uh, for time, they'd base it maybe on the phase of the moon or as soon as the snows melted or some other such seasonal marker. Whatever it was, it wasn't real precise. And you didn't have any way to let the other guy know if you were running late. So what happened if you got lost or sick or injured? What if you show up for the meeting and old Jeb isn't there? How long do you hang out at the fork in the river before you figure that maybe a bear got Jeb? Do you go looking for old Jeb? And if so, where do you look? How long do you look? Now, you may be wondering what old Jeb and the bear have to do with the Sermon on the Mount. Well, here's my point. Those mountain men were a different breed. There were people who had chosen to live out of the mainstream of society. They were a hardy breed, acclimated to life in the high country. And they had learned a different set of skills. They'd embraced different values. And what Jesus taught his disciples up on that mountainside was a whole new way of life. It was a new culture. It was going to call for new skills and new ways of thinking. It was going to take them out of the mainstream of society. They might even look, talk, or act a little odd in the eyes of others. But he was calling them not to follow the crowd, but to follow him up into the high country, to prepare their hearts for nothing less than God's kingdom. They were quickly going to discover that parts of that climb were literally impossible for them to scale on their own. We're going to discover the same. But the one calling us has gone ahead of us, and he has made a way. So let's dig in and start learning what it means to be mountain folk. Today we're going to look at just one verse. This comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the salt of the earth. Salt isn't really a big deal in my life. I mean, there is a small shaker of the stuff in our kitchen, and we like to add it to food for some flavor, but that's really about it. Now, if you have livestock, you realize that salt is a little bigger deal. Large animals like cows and horses and uh, goats need salt added to their diet to stay healthy. And, and a little salt shaker is not going to cut it for a 1,200 pound cow. And that's why feed stores carry salt blocks. In fact, when I went to pick up this salt block, it was one of the smaller ones they had. I could have got a 
25, I think even a 50 pound block of salt. But salt in the old world, especially in a hot environment like the Mideast, was vital not just as a seasoning, but as a preservative. At the historical moment in which Jesus was teaching, there were no refrigerators. Now, we know that ancient civilizations knew how to harvest ice. They could even store it and use it uh, for long periods by building these insulated pits. But those things were incredibly labor intensive and it was the sort of luxury that was only enjoyed by the rich and the powerful. The far more common method of preserving food was with salt. Pliny the Elder, a Roman naturalist and philosopher, military leader who had lived about the same time as Jesus, said in his book, Natural History, that nothing is more useful than salt and sunshine. Now, when Jesus talked about salt, the first thing that his listeners thought of wasn't just flavor, but preservation. And what was it Jesus said needed preserving? the world. Now when we talk about preserving in this sense, we aren't talking about maintaining the status quo. That is one kind of preservation for sure. Here in our local area, we have the North Olympic Land Trust. It's a group that raises funds and works to preserve farmlands and other open spaces. We see value in keeping some of those spaces the way they are rather than allowing construction or other development. In that sense, preservation is simply leaving things the way they are. But the other kind of preservation is when we act against the natural course of things to prevent things breaking down. I paint my house from time to time because if I didn't, the wood would naturally weather and split and rot and eventually my house, left completely on its own, would become unlivable. I put milk back in the refrigerator for the same reason. Left on the counter, it will quite naturally become undrinkable. Jesus here indicates that likewise, the world, left alone, will decay. Now when he speaks of the world, he's not talking about the natural world of fields and house siding and quarts of milk. He's talking about the societal world of mankind. Now, you don't need to be a sociologist to recognize that societies break down. Pick any society in history, trace its path far enough back and you will see it break down. The Medes, the great Persian Empire, the thousand year reign of Rome, the British Empire that once boasted it was so broad that the sun never set on their domain. Hitler who believed that he could build another thousand year empire like Rome, which by the way only lasted 12 years. And if you pick through the ruins of all those great civilizations, you will find that they usually rotted from the inside out. Corruption, greed, tyranny, betrayal. In the late 1930s, W.H. Auden came to the United States to escape war-torn Europe. While attending a theater that was located in a largely German immigrant section of Manhattan, he saw a newsreel telling of the Nazi invasion of Poland. And as pictures of the Polish people appeared on screen, Auden was stunned to hear people chanting, kill them, kill them. Auden, who identified himself as an atheist and believed in man's innate ability to evolve and improve, was stunned by what he heard. What he suddenly saw was that human nature was not intrinsically good. Left to their own greeds and prejudices, societies decay. That realization started a spiritual quest that ultimately led him to Christ. Speaking to our own time, Shadi Hamid wrote an article in this month's issue of The Atlantic titled, America Without God. Addressing the increasing polarization of our society combined with the decrease in religious life in America, a 50% drop since 1998, the sharpest in U.S. history, he notes this. If secularists 
hoped that declining religiosity would make for more rational politics. Drained of faith's inflaming passions, they are likely disappointed. As Christianity's hold in particular has weakened, ideological intensity and fragmentation have risen. John Stott says, The world is putrefying. It cannot stop itself from going bad. Jesus knew that reality well. But his answer wasn't political revolution. He never raised an army. His answer wasn't an educational program. The, the problem in society isn't a lack of information. Our world has never been more educated and informed. But does it honestly look like we're really getting better? Is there more peace? Is there less greed? Is there less dishonesty, less betrayal? His answer was a call to a small group of men and women to follow a different path, to follow him and then somehow through that relationship become a preserving influence in their world. There was one warning though, and that was that they not lose their saltiness. Now, salt can't literally lose its saltiness. You can dissolve a teaspoon of salt in a glass of water, and if you carefully evaporate the water, you will still have a teaspoon of salt. So, what does Jesus mean when he talks about salt losing its saltiness? John Stott related what Dr. David Turk had told him about salt in ancient Palestine. Uh, here's what he said. What was then popularly called salt was in fact a white powder, perhaps from around the Dead Sea, which, while containing sodium chloride, also contained much else, since in those days there were no refineries. Of this dust, the sodium chloride was probably the most soluble comp component, and so the most easily washed out. The residue of white powder still looked like salt, and was doubtless still called salt, but it neither tasted nor acted like salt. It was just road dust. Have you ever made soup and put in too much salt? One way to solve the problem is to make more soup, add more water, more potatoes, dilute the pot until the salt isn't a factor. What Jesus is warning his followers about is allowing their lives, their values, their choices, their priorities to become so diluted, to take in so much of the values, choices, speech, priorities of the decaying world system in which they live, that they cease to have any distinct influence. We sound, look, and act so much like everybody else that it would be a real surprise to them if they found out we went to church on Sunday. So what does a salty Christian look like? Well, that really takes us back to the opening statement of this sermon, the Beatitudes. Recognizing our own poverty of spirit and renouncing our pride. Mourning over sin, showing meekness rather than demandingness. Hungering, thirsting for true righteousness. Seeking to live and treat others with purity. Making peace, seeking reconciliation. Standing for what is right in God's eyes, even when it earns us the scorn and abuse of those who do not value His ways. Those things earn favor in God's eyes for sure. Jesus proclaimed those who embrace such things blessed, and He promised them great future blessing. But those virtues brought to bear on our decaying world also have a preserving influence. They help stop the rot. The continent of Africa has long been a place of both great opportunity and development, but also great suffering and poverty. Matthew Paris grew up in South Africa, later moving to England as a journalist. And then some years later, he returned to the land of his birth, eager to help in humanitarian aid projects. From that experience, he wrote an article in the Times of London back in 2008 titled, as an atheist, I truly believe Africa needs God. Here's what he said. A confirmed atheist, I've become convinced 
of the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa, sharply distinct from the work of secular NGOs, government projects, and international aid efforts. These alone will not do. Education and training alone will not do. In Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts. It brings a spiritual transformation. The rebirth is real. The change is good. So what did he discover? He discovered Christians being salt. And it stretches farther than just humanitarian aid. I read recently the story of Antoine Rodesire, who was born a member of the Tutsi people in Rwanda. He grew up surrounded by violence and unrest of the Tutsi and Hutu conflicts. In 1963, his father was killed by Hutus. In 1973, while attending college, his Hutu classmates turned on him and his fellow Tutsi students tried to drive them out of the school. After graduating with honors, looking forward to a good teaching career, he was told by the university director, don't you understand? You will never join the university faculty. The reason? Well, he was a Tutsi. Anger consumed him. His life seemed to have no purpose, and in his depression, he shut himself off. Alone and bored, he began reading the Bible. And as he read, God's Spirit began reaching into Antoine's heart. He became a Jesus follower, up to a point. One day, while reading the Bible, he came to the account of Jesus on the cross, praying for forgiveness for his enemies. And as he read, he felt God calling him to forgive the Hutus who had killed his father. His response was, forget it, God. Surely you don't expect me to forgive the Hutu for killing my father. I will follow you, always, everywhere, but I take a detour here. I cannot forgive them. And thus began a two-week wrestling match in Antoine's mind and heart. Eventually, though, God brought him to the place of forgiveness. Now, that was not the end of the violence. Antoine and his family had to flee their homeland, but when the fighting finally ended, he returned with a burning desire to talk to his people about the need to repent and forgive each other. Not a popular message, but a distinctively Christian one. One morning, a young woman appeared at his office. She told him that her father was a man named Gashugi, the one who had orchestrated the killing of Tutsis in Antoine's village. Sobbing, she told him that she had heard his talk and recognized her father as the one who was responsible for the murder of Antoine's father. She was deeply ashamed, crushed by the wicked reputation of her father, shunned by all who knew him. She was desperate to find someone of whom she could ask forgiveness. When she heard Antoine's talk, it gave her a glimmer of hope. Perhaps someone would forgive her. With tears flowing, Antoine brought witnesses into his office, and they gathered around as he took that young woman's hand and began speaking words of forgiveness, praying blessing over her life. When it was finished, Antoine said that he felt like he had found a sister. Stories like Antoine's were repeated all across Rwanda by Christians following in the painful and yet life-giving steps of Jesus. And because of it, countless lives were saved by the simple and yet profound act of Christians doing something distinctly Christian, forgiving their enemies, showing mercy, making peace, rubbing the salt of the gospel into a culture corrupted by hatred and murder. So how do we become salt in our community? Years ago, Becky Pipper wrote a book titled Out of the Salt Shaker. Her point was that Christ did not call his people to huddle up inside the walls of the church. We're not called just to be a, a salt block, if you will, and wait for people to come to us. 
We are called to engage with our world, to live out and proclaim the message of Jesus, to go out there in the same way that you want salt to get out of the salt shaker. Salt has to get out and get into the world if it's going to have any real effect. The first place we sprinkle is in our neighborhood. It means that we treat our neighbor across the fence. The contractor who's working at our house, the clerk that we meet at the store, the waitress who comes to our table, the teacher in our child's class. We treat them all the way that Jesus calls us to love. And then we go broader. We look for ways to love our community. Where is the rot? Uh, where the rot of this world is tearing at our community. And, and we look to find ways that we can help to be a light. I know people who are going regularly to our prison, our jails, to minister there. Uh, families like the Gishes in our church and others are involved in feeding the homeless in Port Angeles. One of the ministries I am so excited about is something called the Love Box. Uh, the Love Box is comprised of a group of people who have committed to come alongside a family that is fostering children and help share the burden by providing some meals, some extra help caring for kids, doing chores around the house. There's a perfect place where followers of Jesus who hunger for righteousness are stepping into an area of genuine need to bring love and help. Our Celebrate Recovery Ministry helps those who have been caught in addictions to find freedom. The Lilies of the Valley Home is providing a safe place for women in recovery. Obria provides help for women who might otherwise believe abortion is their only option. So where could God use you to help make a difference? To be salt. Remember though that first and foremost we need to be people who have our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus. That our choices and priorities stay firmly rooted in His. Otherwise, we will lose our saltiness. We'll become just another special interest group with a polluted and mixed motive and agenda. And perhaps nowhere is that more important than this next area that I want to discuss briefly, politics. Politics can affect great change, but it is messy business. If you want to see an area where the pursuit of righteousness can quickly become diluted with compromise and power plays, you need look no further. There are plenty of examples of people who entered politics with high ideals only to become part of the system and in the end have their saltiness look like little more than ancient Palestinian road dust. So should Christians avoid politics? Absolutely not. Followers of Christ should engage in politics just like we should engage in business, education, agriculture, entertainment. Diluted salt is no good, but neither is salt that isn't sprinkled into the full spectrum of society. I spoke to this a few weeks ago, and it was so encouraging, the wave of positive response I received from so many of you. Now, without rehashing what I said then, let me think with you a bit more about this issue of the church and politics. I promise it'll be brief. As I've been studying the Sermon on the Mount, I've been reading Martin Lloyd-Jones' classic, Studies on the Sermon on the Mount. The book was published in 1960. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a Welsh minister who pastored Westminster Chapel in London for almost 30 years. Now in his day, one of the hot topics was the rise of communism and his atheistic worldview. But let me share a bit of what he said to another people in another time that I think still has a lot of wisdom for us in our time. As Christians, we are citizens of a country that it is our business to play a part of as citizens and thereby act as salt indirectly in innumerable respects. But that is a very different thing from the church doing so. The primary task of the church is to evangelize and to preach the gospel. If the Christian church today spends most of her time in denouncing communism, it seems to me that the main result will be that communists will not be likely to listen to the preaching of the gospel. If the church is always denouncing one particular section of society, she is shutting the evangelistic door 
upon that section. Listen to Paul's words from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Paul was clear on his mission as an apostle. His calling was to preach the gospel, and that may being able and willing to cross cultural and political divides. As a church, I agree with Lloyd-Jones. We should maintain a posture that allows us to talk about the gospel with as many people as possible. So, should the church, as an organized body, act as a political action committee? Are there political issues that have direct bearing on the ability of the church to live faithfully to the gospel? Yes. And, and where there are, I think it is appropriate to engage, to be informed and encourage action on things that would hamper the gospel. Are there political issues that have direct bearing on significant moral issues? Well, of course, and I think it's appropriate to address those. We believe that laws which protect life in all its stages are vital and should be apolitical. Where it gets murky is that almost every political issue has some aspect an informed Christian can have legitimate, faith-driven concerns over. However, if we let the church as an organization embroil itself in all of those things, I guarantee you some ugly things will come from it. The first is division. There are sincere, biblically informed followers of Jesus who have sincere, thoughtful, and faith-driven points of disagreement when it comes to politics. To unnecessarily bring those debates into the fellowship of the church is to invite partisan divisions. Second, a lost opportunity for the gospel. As Lloyd-Jones points out, when the church, as an organization, entrenches itself with political parties and movements, we effectively close doors of witness for the gospel along partisan lines. Third is a compromised witness. When the organized church embroils itself in the cauldron of political action, it very quickly finds itself tempted to the compromises and gamesmanship and, delight and divided loyalties that plague politics. Charles Colson built his career as a hardcore political operative. As a member of President Richard Nixon's cabinet, he earned the reputation as Nixon's political hatchet man. And one of the groups he prided himself on manipulating for political gain were evangelical conservatives. When Nixon was impeached, it was Charles Colson who went to prison. But it was through his collapse that Colson truly met Jesus. Upon his release, he spent the remainder of his life working tirelessly to bring the gospel to prisoners and to seek prison reform. While Colson left behind his life as a political hack, he still remained politically aware and often wrote and spoke about current issues from a Christian perspective. He also encouraged Christians to be politically active. However, he was also quick to point out the dangers and to advise great caution. In 1987, he wrote an excellent book addressing the tension between faith and politics. The book was titled, Kingdoms in Conflict. Listen to his words. When the church aligns itself politically, it gives priority to the compromises and temporal successes of the political world rather than its Christian confession of eternal truth. And when the church gives up its rightful place as the conscience of the culture, the consequences for society can be horrific. Well, here's what the church is able to do politically by keeping a healthy separation with politics. First, we keep an open door to proclaim the gospel to all people. And people whose hearts are transformed by the gospel also often find their politics transformed as well. Second, we maintain a purity of calling, 
that allows us to speak against abuses of power and unjust laws across the political spectrum. Without concern for garnering political favor with any party or politician. Third, we provide a place of accountability and refuge and counsel for those Christians who are called to serve in the sphere of politics. A place where they can step away from the, de the decay that so often eats away within politics and have their own saltiness restored and strengthened. So what should you do in the realm of politics? How do you be salty? Well, first, be informed. There are some excellent organizations whose mission is to help inform and mobilize political action from a Christian worldview. But don't just listen to an echo chamber. Find out why those who disagree with you do so. Pray for grace and wisdom to listen well and for kind, thoughtful words to present your views. That is salt sprinkling itself into society and making a difference. A second thing is be involved. Write to your representatives when you have concerns, but do it with respect. Let them hear your voice. That is a great privilege that we have in our country. Third, always vote. I'm shocked when I hear of Christians who don't vote. You've been given a vote. We have a duty to love our neighbors as best we can in every way we can. So use your vote as best you can to do that. And then fourth, always pray. Paul encouraged Christians to pray for all those in authority, not just those we agree with. You see, mountain folk don't stay on the mountain. Uh, they come down and spread out. They find ways to sprinkle the preserving influence and sweet savor of the gospel all through the world. Live like mountain folk. was great. My God, my Savior has ransomed.
Well, good morning. I'm Sean Stanton. You know, recently I read a book called Salt, A World History. Some fascinating things about salt were in that book. Did you know that towns and cities were actually built because of their proximity to salt? These cities prospered because of their ability to sell and trade salt. Also, long distance travel, whether by sea or by land, was made possible because of the preserving properties of salt. Salt was a commodity and even currency was produced on coins made of salt. And then lastly, did you know that salt is the only mineral that we eat? So those are some fun facts on salt. So the ancient people that Jesus was speaking to were very aware of the power and dependency on salt. And when Jesus refers to those listeners as salt of the earth, they knew it would have significant meaning. The Beatitudes are a recipe for making salt. By that I mean that if a person responded correctly to what Jesus said there, those listeners would indeed become salt of the earth. Matthew 5.13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So here are our discussion and reflection questions for today. Is being salt of the earth about doing or being or both? Explain and review the Beatitudes to help answer this question. Second one, as a believer, how are you salt of the earth? And then lastly, how can we lose our saltiness? And more importantly, how can we guard against losing our saltiness? So those are the questions for today. A couple of things also I want to add. Uh, this Friday, April 2nd, is Good Friday. So I want to encourage you to think about making time to engulf yourself in the events that began to unfold on that tragic evening. Maybe it's an evening spent with your small group in a special way for a most special evening. So that's just something to consider, making Good Friday a special time. Also, the latest COVID news and restrictions. So groups of 10, our governor says, can now gather, but they need to wear masks. However, the CDC says no masks are required if vaccinated. So I'll let you do with that what you will. I will see you next week on Easter. And uh, I hope you really have a good time this week in considering what Jesus did on the cross and the resurrection. All right, take care.